Howdy! I'm your host, Josh Niepert, and this is episode 3 of the Plutarch Project. Today we're going to do something a little different. Over the past few episodes, we've talked about the origin of the humanities and how semiotics has changed the way scholars study language. Today we're going to take a look at writing, and then we're going to apply it to relatively contemporary media. Stargate. Due to data constraints, we're going to have to break this topic and its application into two separate episodes. Uh, sorry for any inconveniences this might cause some of you fine folks. It should be a pretty clear split this time, though. The first part of this series will click quickly cover the history of writing and a lovely gentleman and anthropologist named Claude Levi Strauss and his work Triste Tropique. In the second episode, we'll apply this to the 1994 science fiction film, some say masterpiece, Stargate. I know a few ears perked up on that last one. If you haven't watched Stargate, I highly recommend watching it beforehand. If not, you're going to get a few spoilers. Don't say I didn't warn you. So let's break out our beach bodies, put on some spray tan, a fanny pack, sun visor, and let's party like it's 3100 BECE. Woo! The spoken word had been around for a very long time by the time writing appeared. At first, writing was mostly used as a tool for the calculation of numbers. Uh, this started about 40,000 years ago. The earliest existing proof of telling marks is the Lebombo bone in Africa. Radiocarbon dating has its age at around 44,000 years old. The Labombo bone, which, which is pretty fun to say, I recommend uh, giving a shot in your car or on your walk or whatever you're doing, is a broken baboon bone with 29 notches on it. Some scholars think that these 29 notches signify that women were the first mathematicians, keeping track of their menstrual cycles with a lunar calendar. Take that little bit of uh, interesting theory with you today. Go ahead, share that with somebody. This later evolved into using clay tokens with specific signs on them to refer to numbers. This was about 8,000 or so years ago. These small clay tokens would be stored together in a satchel or clay vessel. Later pictograms evolved into archaic numerals. It's at about this time when writing representing language became a thing. Enter cuneiform. Sumer. This is where writing language first started. Sumer is the earliest known large civilization. The area this civilization was located in is actually modern-day Iraq. It's neat to consider the vast amounts of history that have sprung out of this one relatively small area of the world. The Assyrians, the Akkadians, Babylonians, the Islamic conquests, and of course, the United States' most recent conflict. Out of this region, the spoken word became the written. The name cuneiform derives from the Latin cuneus, meaning wedge. The Sumerians used a reed to help make the symbols that they used. This gave the script a lot of wedge-shaped uh, appearances of the strokes. If you just Google it, uh, you'll see what I mean. It's, it is very obvious why they named it after uh, the Latin cuneus. About two or three hundred years later, Sumerian glyphs began to represent sounds using the rebus principle. The rebus principle is, quote, the use of existing symbols, such as pictograms, purely for their sounds regardless of their meaning to represent new words. Many ancient writing systems use the rebus principle to represent abstract words, which otherwise would be hard to, to be represented by pictograms, unquote. This sounds a little strange, but I promise you've seen this before somewhere else. If I had a piece of paper with an eyeball, next to the eyeball was a picture of the ocean, and next to the picture of the ocean, the letter U, it's not a leap of faith to see that these signs, with their original oral sounds, represent the signified uh, phrase, I see you. By doing this, they would combine the symbols with one or more phonetic sounds. Later, specific types of symbols, much like the Chinese and Japanese use today, help the reader to understand the nature of the topics and give phonetic clues at how it was pronounced. At about the same time as the Sumerians, ancient Egyptians began their own writing system. Scholars still debate if it is something that developed out of the Sumerian system or if they developed it independently. 
Other written language systems evolved in China and what is now Mexico, independent of Sumeria. One of the earliest long-form pieces of writing that has been translated into English and other languages is the Code of Hammurabi. Hammurabi was the sixth king of ancient Babylonia, and he found himself facing a problem of codifying certain things about the society he ruled over. He chose laws for various facets of society to follow, such as wages for certain careers and other social rules to help keep the society he ruled over in line and give them a common guide to follow. It was then that he, in his words, met the ancient Babylonian god of justice, Shemash. Look for the movie next year. Uh, maybe Disney will put it out. Shemash by Disney. Who gave him the code? In the introduction of the law, it states, Anu, uh, who is the main, most powerful god in the Sumerian religion, and Bel, Bel being an honorific title for other gods, including Shemash in this case, called me by the name Hammurabi, the exalted prince who feared God to bring about the rule of righteousness in the land, to destroy the wicked and the evil doers, so that the strong should not harm the weak, so that I should rule over the black-headed people like Shamash, and enlighten the land to further the well-being of mankind." Unquote. This code was unique in that even today it has ramifications. The Code of Hammurabi was one of the first law codes to place a substantial emphasis on the punishment of the perpetrator, mostly being in regards to physical reciprocations. It had very specific penalties for each crime depending on your rank in society, and is among the first codes to establish the presumption of innocence, something we still maintain even today, and it plays an important role in our justice system. It is also notable to say this is where the whole eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth idea was first stated. Among equals in society, and if offense was committed, an exact repayment was to be paid. For those with lower status, chiefly uh, women, slaves, and children, some type of payment or punishment would be due as well. For example, the code states, If a man knocks out the teeth of his equal, his teeth shall be knocked out as well. And here's another one. If a man strikes a freeborn woman so that she loses her unborn child, he shall pay ten shekels for her loss. Most of the laws deal with the rights of property, but occasionally there are some interesting rules that pop up. If you like to see it, uh, you can book a ticket, first class of course, or simply fire up the G5 and head to Paris and visit it at the Louvre. Texts like this help to give the ancient Babylonian society the ability to transfer codified knowledge through long swaths of time. It's kind of like a time capsule. One generation has a way of looking at the world or finds a series of ideas that helps things run more smoothly, and they decide to pass them on. For most of time, this was an oral act. Laws, cult cultural myths, religion, and just about everything were passed on through oral tradition. In a lot of ways, this is great. Culture passes from one generation to the next, the magical human tool of language is put to a pragmatic use, and there were campfire stories every night. No marshmallows, though. What a shame. But, that's right, there's a big juicy butt here, just waiting for you. Writing helps to do this and more. It allows for language to maintain a specific structure, provides accurate proof that isn't faulted by aging minds, and can be sent off to folks far distended from the initial audience. In short, it gives a society a collective mind that is passed on from one generation to the next. It gives a culture or society the ability to maintain power long after the authors have turned to dust. Don't believe me? Take a look at all the holy books throughout time. The common myths or stories shared by these books help to maintain the bonds within a society by giving them a common banner to fly under, and a medium in which they can all relate. Simultaneously, writing is also a tool for mass exploitation. Without the invention of writing, and by default reading, societies with large numbers of people would nearly be impossible to maintain. If you're an American, how often do you hear the Constitution being referenced in contemporary political debates, or other aspects of our judicial system or law? One scholar who happened upon a realization of the power of writing was Cloud Levi Strauss. Not the jeans guy, 
that was Loeb, Loeb Levi Strauss. Uh, so, Claude Levi Strauss was an anthropologist. He was born in Brussels, Belgium. His father was a painter, and his grandfather was a rabbi. He grew up mostly in Paris, but later roamed around France teaching philosophy in secondary schools. Shortly before World War II, he spent time in Brazil's interior studying the local indigenous peoples. The fieldwork he did during this time would lead to his most famous work, Tris Tropique, or in English, Sad Tropics, published in 1955. The title's origin is in regards to the unconscious, <laughs> unconscionable loss of all societies previously untouched and uncontaminated by the Western world. Levi Strauss did a lot of influential work on how cultural myths pervade society. Today we'll focus on his insights into writing. So let's go way back, uh, actually not that far, about a hundred years, back to 1915. In chapter 28 of Tristropic, titled A Writing Lesson, Levi Strauss comes face to face with the power that writing has. He has been working with the Nambikiwara pe people, <laughs> a tribe of people in the Amazon. Levi Strauss handed out papers and pencils as a gift to some of the tribe members something he had done before with other tribes he had encountered. After a few days, he saw them making wavy lines and zigzags on the paper. He states, quote, I wondered what they were trying to do. Then it was suddenly borne upon me that they were writing, or to be more accurate, they were trying to use their pencils in the same way I did mine, unquote. Later, the chief of this tribe asked for a pad of paper and a pencil, Levi Strauss, would ask him questions and the chief would make lines and squiggles on the pad, then he would show it to them. Then he would explain what it said through speech. Levi Strauss found this amusing. The same chief later tried to leverage his ability to, quote, write, unquote, as a form of social power over other members of the tribe. As Levi Strauss writes, it had not been a question of acquiring knowledge, of remembering or understanding, but rather of increasing the authority and prestige of one individual or function at the expense of others. Uh, Levi Strauss talks about the benefits of writing after recounting this episode with the tribe's chief. He notes the ability to pass on past achievements, the setting of goals for future generations, and the same collective consciousness we discussed earlier. He notes that societies without writing are, quote, incapable of remembering beyond the narrow margin of individual memory, and seem bound to remain in prison in a fluctuating history which will always lack both a beginning and any lasting awareness or aim." Unquote. That's pretty harsh. Writing instantly infected the Nambikiwara tribe. The chief looked at the wavy lines on a piece of paper and another on clay and feigned the ability to read a list of things the scientist had given and had received. Later he would try to solidify his power within the group only for it to backfire and for him and his wife to become outcasts after Levi Strauss and his group had moved on to another tribe of people. Levi Strauss noted that the inability of others to be able to read basically made writing useless. Those that saw what the chief was doing called bullshit and ostracized him for the trickery. Levi Strauss notes, Quote, I could not help admiring their chief's genius in instantly recognizing that writing could increase his authority, thus grasping the basis of the institution without knowing how to use it. Unquote. Levi Strauss notes the benefits of writing, but actually deems them to be secondary to the primary power of writing, which he believed to be exploitation. He writes, quote, My hypothesis, if correct, would oblige us to recognize the fact that the primary function of written communication is to facilitate slavery." Unquote. With writing bolstering the power of those with power, other people must be able to read. In order to be slaves, we, must, we have to be able to read. This puts a little bit of a damper on those high literacy rates across the world, now doesn't it? Levi Strauss writes, everyone, oh, sorry, quote, everyone must be able to read so that the government can Say, dot, dot, dot. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. Unquote. So next time you're in your, uh, you know, Alabama church, wearing a fake mustache that makes people laugh, and you get arrested, you cannot feign ignorance of the law. 
No, seriously. That's a real law that's on the books in Alabama. Be careful out there, people. Be careful. On the one hand, the written word has the power to pass on information, inform people of things that they may otherwise be ignorant about, connect minds to ideas through space and time, and to entertain us. On the other hand, it might also have the ability to enslave people. That's a win-win situation if I ever saw one. We're going to look at this closer in the next podcast, both being released at the same time. Yeehaw! In the meantime, think about how writing influences your day-to-day life as a worker, as a student, as a citizen, as a reader of erotic literature, as an informed member of a large English-speaking community, and let us know how it affects you. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening, and until next time, onward. Shamash! If you enjoy this podcast, why not consider supporting us? We have a Patreon page, patreon.com slash Plutarch Project, uh, an Amazon and booking.com banner. If you are planning on buying something from Amazon or treating yourself to a nice hotel stay, we also have Google Ads on all the pages of the website. Click one and give us some of that dirty Google money for nothing but a moment of your time. If you'd like to read the transcripts or find out about other interesting topics in the humanities, check out our website at plutarchproject.com. If you notice any errors, have a question or comment, or just want to shoot the breeze, you can email us at theplutarchproject at gmail.com or in the sidebar of the website. Or even on Facebook. Heck, we're all over the show. Thanks for your precious time. Good day!